So, um, thank you uh, for coming. Uh, the, the topic of my talk today is called uh, Project Hello World, and I recognize that that's a pretty um, forward choice for the title of a, of, a, of a project, but we'll get there. Um, so, my name is Roland Wells. That's my Twitter down there. Uh, I don't use it a whole lot, but if someone finds me there, I'll respond. So, um, Project Hello World um, is a project that I've been working on for about four years. And um, basically, the project is a, an education and connectivity project in Africa. Um, at least that's what we thought it was. And as we got into it, what we realized is that there's a little bit more to that story. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, this is in a uh, small community in Uganda, about halfway up a ancient volcano um, in a uh, banana plantation area. And um, there's no power, there's no uh, running water, or anything like that. And over the last four years, I've had the kind of honor and pleasure and, and experience, well, the experience of watching someone uh, the first time that they're able to connect to the internet. Um, and at first I thought that that was going to be this amazing kind of joy, joyful or fun experience. And what I've, I've seen over the last four years is, in fact, there's quite a big range uh, of that experience. That experience is fun for some, it's exciting for some people, and it's incredibly serious for some people. Uh, what I've found is that some people have been understanding that there's this world connected through the internet, and they've been talking about it and hearing about it for a, a decade, um, and, and understood that it's quite significant. And then, so for that person, the first time that there's a, a connection, it's actually quite serious. Um, so this is the moment that that community uh, in, in Uganda was uh, connected to the internet for the first time. Um, and they're looking at a little monitor um, that has my friend in New York City that's talking uh, to the community there. <clears throat> so, um, five years ago, uh, I was living in um, the Midwest in the United States, and I got a call, um, a Skype call from someone I didn't know who was in Ethiopia, in a very remote region in Ethiopia. And she had been referred to, to call me because I had been working with young people in technology in the United States. And um, she had, had been quite involved with uh, human, human rights and educational NGOs in Africa for quite some time. And uh, she had been asked to go visit a community that in, in a remote area and evaluate a tech, uh, an education project that was there that had been running for some time. And when she got there, there was a small hut uh, that was supposed to be the school. Uh, there was no teacher. And as she got into the conversations with the community, she recognized that the school, the hut, was in the wrong place. Uh, it was a nomadic community, so by definition, kind of in the wrong place. Um, and that every time that there was any kind of a teacher that was able to be brought in, they very quickly didn't work out for some reason or another. Um, and so in the evaluation of this project, the question came up as, well, in, in some situations, traditional bricks and mortar school, schools can't work. Um, and so what do we do? And there was a question that she had uh, about perhaps technology could, could do something. Uh, but in terms of the problem, when you start looking at it, um, it was one of the things that informed the, the way our project developed. And um, that is simply the extent of the problem. Uh, if, if you look at this, the education gap, there's tens of millions of children all over the world. There's a, you know, over 100 million children all over the world that don't have access to, to education for one reason or another. And the effects of those, the impacts of, of that lack or that gap of education is significant. So um, there's all, all kinds of reasons why that doesn't, uh, that, that gap exists. Um, but one of the key ones is, is funding. Um, if you kind of, if you went and looked at all the funding that was out there, 
that was dedicated to education and you added it and, and you applied it to that need, it wouldn't even begin to touch the problem if it's in the context of schools uh, being built and teachers being provided. It's just, th there's not even a beginning of that connection. So it just is not, th there's no possibility of solving the education gap with the current strategy of building schools and hiring teachers. Uh, there's all kinds of other reasons why there's also problems. And, and when, we, when we started talking about this problem that we were, she was looking at, um, we started understanding that there's a, there's a possibility that uh, technology can do something. And so some of the, the uh, requirements that we started looking at were, one, this, this has to be something that is possible in a remote location. Um, so that means almost by definition that there isn't an existing uh, school system or school infrastructure or uh, teacher training or administration or something like that present. Um, it has to be scalable. The problem is so massive that it has to be easily scalable. And that doesn't just mean putting it in, that means keeping it going. Um, it has to be cheap comparatively because there's a massive uh, uh, funding deficit there. Um, it has to be simple, so that maybe was one of the kind of, that was informed by some of these earlier points where that's something that has to be doable, it can't be so complex that it would take forever to kind of figure out how to do it. Um, and because of the challenge of building schools and hiring teachers, it has to, it, it, or it probably means that there's new ways of education. Um, if, if you take away the schools and the teachers and say, well, how do we educate, it has to be a, a different way. Um, and the last one is, is it has to be dynamic. Um, all of the work the organization that, I'm, that I work with now does uh, is open source and led by the community. Um, and so that's a, a, a principle of respect that we apply to the work, but it also means that the projects that we do have uh, a dynamism. So they, they change and they're able to kind of improve and change over time. So this is what we started looking at. The, the first, the, at the time, the, and, and still quite, uh, I think prevalent is this idea of tablets. Let's, well, why don't, let's get tablets to everyone. Uh, or a single device, let's do a low-cost device and try and get everyone in the world this low-cost device. Um, but when you look at that, both from a funding perspective and from a scalability perspective, you immediately run into some problems. Um, so kind of maintaining, maintaining 200 uh, tablets in a pilot project is one thing. When you start talking about 10 million tablets, it's a completely uh, separate kind of logistical challenge. Um, so we, we pretty early said, well, tablets are interesting, but in the context of remoteness um, and ongoing maintenance, uh, it seems that there's a huge logistical challenge there that I have no idea how to kind of look at. Um, so uh, what we started also looking at is the way that people learn and young people learn. And at the time, there was a TED Talk that Sugata Mitra did called The Hole in the Wall Project. Has anyone, anyone seen that? Um, where he stuck some kiosk type computers in, the, in, in literal concrete walls in Delhi and just watched what happened. And there was all sorts of educational outcomes that were very interesting um, that were quite surprising. For instance, language didn't seem to be a problem. So young people particularly don't seem to care that, they're, that the language of the internet is different than their primary language and they, they figure out ways to get around. Uh, and then start learning the language. Um, the, there was this really, and, and one of the striking things around education that we found was there's this really neat thing that happens when you have multiple people looking at one screen together, one large screen together, where you transform that learning environment from a kind of single uh, data flow to this collaborative environment. Um, and it's something, just like the moment of watching people connect for the first time, it's something that I've been uh, really surprised by over and over and over again, where, uh, in, for instance, one of the, the hubs that we built, there was children, they were always playing this typing game, and I was like, ah, well, there's all these other things that we can do on this system, and there's all these other places on the internet that are far more interesting. Let's try and do some of these. Um, and, and every time I'd go back to back on the typing game. But when you just sit back for a minute and watch, it's not someone learning how to type. There's like 10 children, and it's become this sport. And it's this collaborative environment that we're all, they're all kind of involved and it's this really interesting um, 
env learning environment that's happening that's totally different than one person attached to one screen. Um, and so one of the, the, this, the decisions we made was that it wasn't so important to have one device per person. Uh, and in fact, there might be some really interesting stuff that can happen uh, when you collaborate. And what we came up with was uh, a community-owned, community-built public internet kiosk. And um, we, so each, and that's called a Hello Hub. And each one of them has two public-facing terminals, so two full desktop uh, ter terminals, um, a Wi-Fi access point for individual devices, and a USB charging point. It's quite simple. Um, it uh, has to be, had to be uh, independent and, uh, and kind of disconnected if it needed to be, so it's solar powered. Um, it had to be able to be built and owned by the community, so it had to be standalone. There's other kind of kiosk projects that you'll find that they kind of go find a community building or a building in the public somewhere and kind of bolt it to that wall. And what we thought was, yeah, that's, I mean, that's cool. And then they put the solar panels on top of that building. But then who owns that? Uh, and what does that mean when it's attached to a wall? And who owns that building? And how does that interact with that kiosk? And if you're truly trying to make something that's community owned, um, that actually, there's some interesting play there that uh, changes things a little bit. Um, we wanted it to be something that was built easily and uh, widely and not proprietary, so we, we made it so it was built from commonly available uh, parts for the most part. We'll get into that. Um, and it needed to have educational um, resources both on it, but also, of course, connected to the public internet. Um, so just getting into a little bit of the detail, this is the inside of one of the, uh, the Hello Hub system boxes. It's just a, a basic x86 motherboard. Uh, the two pieces of, of kit that are not kind of available anywhere in the world are the monitor and the keyboard, because those are the pieces that are waterproof and, and kind of uh, rugged and have to kind of work uh, no matter what. And so those pieces are a little bit more expensive and, and you have to find a supplier that uh, can supply those. We've uh, created a, what we call a comms box, which is basically a 2U. It's all built on a, on a server rack, essentially. Uh, which is a, it's a 2U case that houses all the I.O. and the multimedia, so a webcam, uh, headphone jack, uh, speakers, little um, USB port, uh, am sound amplifier, all of those things. Uh, so the Wi-Fi access point is just a, a USB Wi-Fi adapter that is built into the, that is connected to the system. And the PV uh, power system we are keeping all DC, so there's no in inverters. Everything is quite simple. It's quite a simple system. Um, on, the, on the system side, well, that, that is me trying to explain what the internet is, which if you've never done to someone who has no idea what a computer is, actually becomes quite a challenge. So th this picture is actually a kind of a joke in our team because it's, it's me trying to kind of explain with diagrams what the system is and what the internet is and how it all is connected. Um, but after about half an hour, this is a, a woman's group in Sledge, Nigeria, uh, one of the women said, so um, the internet is like a wise man. I said, okay, well, that, that, let's, go, let's go with that as a working definition for now. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, the base system, it's built on Edge Ubuntu, so it's a Linux OS. Uh, we've used... Uh, Multi-seat, I don't know if anyone knows what that is, but basically what that means is you can plug in uh, keyboard, mouse, monitor, two of them into one motherboard, and assign sessions to each one. So there's a full desktop on each session. So we use one, one motherboard, one set of hard drives is the, the, the server, so it has a built-in um, a, a built uh, Apache environment. It's got, does all the routing and everything. Uh, it provides the Wi-Fi access point, but it also provides the full desktop sessions to the, to the user. Um, we've installed Khan Academy Lite, which is a, uh, an educational software um, provider, so that's built in. So even if there's network problems, that is there and all of that content is already there. Uh, and of course, uh, the package repository for Ubuntu is 
you know, has tens of thousands of apps that people could use. Um, part of it is that it's community owned and managed, and so it needs to be kind of expandable to the needs of the community. And so we're trying to choose things that work for that. Um, so why am I here at the Drupal, the, the Drupal um, Dev Days presentation? Part of it is that I live in Verona now, and I'm looking for a community. So uh, that's some, Drupal is something that I've used for many years. Uh, but um, inside the Hello Hub, we have what we call a community portal, which is where users create their user accounts and manage their user accounts, and they interact with each other and other Hello Hub users um, and other Hello Hubs using forums and blog posts and things like that. And that is based on Drupal. So what we've done is in each Hello Hub, there's a web server. It runs Drupal. Uh, if you sign into the system as a guest, it asks you, do you want to create an account? Um, and all of that functionality is based on, is, is running from Drupal. And we've created some scripts that interact with the Drupal install that uh, allow the, the system user management and all of that to happen with the Drupal install. The re one of the reasons why we chose Drupal, of course, is that as the community begins to take over the management and maintenance of the Hello Hub, they will also want to expand it. And Drupal is a perfect uh, platform to, that, to, to be kind of handed over with no special uh, you know, requirements. It's there, and there's t you know, however many thousands of modules and, and expansions that are super easy to, to integrate. So um, after talking a lot about the tech in the project, uh, and I talked about it just for a second in the beginning. Uh, over the years, I've realized that really um, the strengths of our project and, and perhaps the, the most critical pieces of our project are not technology. Um, as we continue and, and work with communities, uh, and our experience tells us that um, the process is actually far more important in most cases to a successful community project. And I thought I'd talk just a moment about that because it's... Uh, it's um, relevant to our project, but I think also just to kind of all open source projects as well. Um, so uh, one of the qu first questions that we always get asked is like, well, when you install a Hello Hub with this equipment in Suez, Nigeria, doesn't it just walk off uh, you know, tomorrow? Isn't it just gone in the next day? And, and I say, well, what do you think about in uh, Columbus Circle, New York City? Probably the same question, right? Um, but um, the, uh, what we decided was that there's, um, there's a huge amount of, apart from being respectful and, and working in partnership with community, because that's something that seems like the right thing to do, there's also very practical, practical reasons to kind of work in a different way than saying, here's your kiosk, we'll bolt it to this police station's wall and we'll put a huge padlock on it. Um, there's reasons not to do that, uh, because that becomes some, some sort of a focus that is perhaps separate from the community. And what we felt is, is that the strength of a project like this ha comes from being owned by the community. And when we looked at scalability, we said, there's no possible way to kind of build 20,000 of these and us manage the repairs on all of them. Technology requires maintenance and require, requires repairs. No matter how kind of military or rugged you get with it, it still requires some maintenance. And so we, so we are saying, okay, the community needs to participate in that. It makes total sense. Um, and we start right from the beginning where the community builds it. Um, but but uh, what results uh, from that building is quite remarkable. Um, so instead of kind of saying, hey, this is yours, when someone builds it, it's, it's theirs. That, that's just a, kind of a, a basic definition, right? Um, we felt that it was really important that there was open and free access. And so that's one of those, com those decisions of not bolting it to someone else's wall as well. It has to be standalone. It has to be truly kind of open and accessible by anyone. Um, and that means that people can uh, feel ownership, utilize it, and not feel like it's being controlled or something by someone else. Uh, maintenance I talked about a little bit. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we'll go to the next one. So a, a couple of stories, I'm uh, just to kind of illustrate, it's kind of hard, it, it's, it's hard to, I mean, other than saying uh, that our Hello Hub in Suleja, Nigeria has been there for three years and is, has been going and is in operation right now, um, there's a couple of stories that just pop out. 
Um, in Suleja, Nigeria, we spent three weeks building the first ever Hello Hub. And, and we spent a lot of time with the community uh, about talking about what it was, how to build it. We built it together. Uh, and then about six months later, I'm talking to uh, the young man, Aliou, who had kind of stepped up and said, I'm going to be this, the, the kind of community support person here and help new people use the hub. Uh, I'm talking to him on Skype at the hub. And we're just, how's the hub going, you know, this and that, how's the community? And then he says, Mr. Roland, I, I need to go. The kids want their hub back. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, cool, all right, bye. And then a couple minutes later, I'm like, wow, there's a lot wrapped up in that. Um, in just that little sentence. And, and so, for instance, when, I was, when we were there, um, the idea that children would speak like that to an adult was qu quite, quite, uh, d didn't happen. To, to kind of express that kind of, like, hey, that's mine, I, I want it back, it didn't happen. I was there for three weeks, and that kind of inter interchange between a young person uh, and a teacher or an adult didn't, didn't happen. Um, likewise, the response from the adult, the idea that Aliyu was really happy about that and was quite kind of, you know, he was kind of laughing about it and was happy to report to me that the kids were wanting their hub back. Um, that also didn't happen particularly. Um, and then the last one, of course, is our hub, my hub. I want my hub back. Uh, and so the, the children are identifying that it's, it's their thing. Um, and now in Nigeria, I often, <laughs> I often don't get told when equipment's replaced. Uh, it just gets fixed. So for the first year, I kind of got calls like, oh, someone left the, the system open and it rained on it. What do we do? I was like, OK, well, let's get a motherboard, and you'll, I'll walk you through it. And, and now I just don't get told. Like, I'll see, like, a, a tweet, tweeted picture or something of some kids replacing a, a keyboard or something like that. So it's really quite striking. Okay, quickly, Olivia, this one, um, we built a hub in her community in Busala, Uganda, last fall. Uh, she kind of muscled her way to the front of every part of that build. And consequently, she, it's her hub. And she doesn't care that someone thinks that the little girl, Olivia, doesn't, shouldn't be at the computer late at night. She sits down in front of it, and it's hers. She, no, one, no one can tell her not to. Uh, I went back and visited in March, so about five months later. And the community had decided to lock the case uh, because it, people kept opening it and messing with it. Nothing was stolen, but people kept opening it and messing with it and kind of turning it off, and it was causing some conflict. So they locked it. And I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to check on the system. Who, who's got the key? <laughs> Olivia has the key. Big, big deal. It was quite, a, quite a, uh, an emotional moment for me, actually. <laughs> um, so where we're at, we've got five Hello Hubs right now. We've got two more in the process in Uganda this year. And um, we're going to build our next big project is a scale project. We want to scale the project and really build many more together because there's some interesting things that they might be able to do together. Uh, and one of the original uh, ideas was the, the concept of re refugee camps because your community has been completely taken away from you. you. You own nothing. And there's kind of a process piece and a connectivity piece and an education piece that seems uh, perfect uh, to, to address needs there. Uh, on the tech side, when this is uh, something here, we're going to release our Drupal code as a module pretty soon. Got some further hardware developments that we're working on. Uh, it's an open source project, so the whole build manual and maintenance manual and all that is being uh, built at, at this URL here, build.hellohub.org. Um, and then I've got some kind of expansion module ideas that I'm working on. All right. Thank you, everyone. And I want to say thank you to the sponsors. Questions. I, I didn't want to take up the whole whole time. So, does anyone have any questions? No, uh, that, that kind of project seems uh, seems like especially interesting for for, for people who are not. So, on one hand, I, I think that you you might have needs for donations hmm. for material donations. Yeah, maybe. sure. Yeah. Um, and also for people working on on your uh, on your uh, open source. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, yeah, so uh, our implementation of, of Hello Hubs is the second one, projecthelloworld.org. Uh, and all the tech and open source stuff we're, we're, is located at hellohub.org. Um, and 
Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why I'm doing the talk today is that we're kind of just getting ready to where we're starting to release code and, and the open source bits, and we definitely are hoping that a community comes around it and gets interested. Well, you know, it's a good question. I mean, right now we're using like the new Atom integrated, like embedded boards. So really basic. And and uh, that determine that that decision has completely to do with power. Uh, so the it's it's quite a kind of um, balance to make sure that the power usage is low enough where you get a num the number of days that you kind of need. You need a couple days with low sun to work. So. Um, we have tested Raspberry Pi and we've tested some other um, like um, uh, ARM chips and we just haven't quite got the performance out of them that runs a full desktop. It was quite important for us to do a desktop, not just like log in and there's a button that's like browser and games. We really wanted there to be a full desktop because you, you kind of are missing the opportunity to bring people fully into what computing is. Um, and so those five, you know, some of these children here, when I went back to visit, uh, are navigating the Ubuntu desktop just like all of us would, uh, just after a couple months, and it's it's quite striking. Yeah, I was a bit worried on the first picture because it seems that the, there were a bunch of young boys around. Yeah. Olivia, but then Olivia. Olivia, yeah. I mean, I th yeah. I, it, so we've also found that 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 time is important. So as long as there's enough kind of, um, as long as there's enough catalysts for that, then things, because Olivia is bringing her sister and her sister's friend. And all that. So as long as you get some, it doesn't have to be 50-50 right away, but you do need to have uh, understanding from the boys that it's okay, and you need to have some girls at the table that are stepping up. And it's, um, the, the building part is important for that. There's a, the, the, the kind of feeling of, this is mine, no one's going to tell me I can't sit here, uh, is, is, is important. Cool. Did I run out of time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good deal. All right, thank you, everyone. Thanks.